This video is brought to you by Harting Technology Group. Harting is a 100% family-owned German company founded in 1945 that has evolved into a trusted global partner known for its cutting-edge railway connectivity solutions. With nearly eight decades of experience, Harting continues to support railway operators and manufacturers worldwide with state-of-the-art components that power the backbone of modern mobility. From their renowned HAN connectors to high-performance cables and smart network components, Harting delivers seamless, sustainable and reliable connectivity. Their innovations not only ensure smooth and safe operations, but also drive the digital transformation of the railway sector, supporting train control, passenger information and onboard entertainment systems. And now Harting is taking another step forward in shaping a greener future. Join the Harting Energy Transition Days 2025, a global event dedicated to the challenges and solutions of decarbonization. Discover how smart connectivity can enable sustainability, efficiency and electrification across sectors, including rail. In the transportation panel, you'll learn how modular concepts and innovative cabling solutions are paving the way for hybrid and battery-powered trains, reducing weight, improving energy distribution, and ensuring future-proof data transmission. Be part of the energy transition and see how Harting is transforming rail for a sustainable tomorrow. Check out the links in the description to learn more and register for the Harting Energy Transition Days 2025. The Hejaz Railway was a 1,300 km narrow gauge line connecting Damascus, the capital of Syria, with Medina in western Saudi Arabia, one of the most important cities in the Muslim world. It ran through the Hejaz region of modern-day Saudi Arabia, hence the name, and included a branch to Haifa on the Mediterranean Sea. Construction of this engineering marvel of the Ottoman railway network was ordered by Sultan Abdul Hamid II in 1900. The original plan envisioned extending the line from Damascus north to the Haidar Pasha station in Istanbul and south from Medina to Mecca. However, this was cut short by the outbreak of the First World War. Damascus was already a natural gathering point for pilgrims, but by the late 19th century the long and hazardous overland journey had begun to lose favor. The route across mountains and deserts was dangerous, with convoys frequently attacked by armed groups. Instead, many pilgrims increasingly turned to safer and faster maritime routes, especially with the rise of steamships. With the Hejaz Railway, Sultan Abdul Hamid sought to reverse this trend and restore the traditional overland pilgrimage. The railway was also conceived in the context of an empire under pressure. By then, the Ottomans faced mounting internal opposition and existential threats, while large parts of the Balkans and North Africa, including Egypt, had already been lost. The Sultan hoped that the ambitious 1,300km project would help bind the empire together and reinforce his authority as Caliph of the Islamic world. Militarily and economically, the line promised to speed up the movement of troops and supplies to strategic areas along the Mediterranean and Red Sea, countering growing British, French and other European expansionism and naval dominance. Skeptics doubted whether the empire could even fund such a project, as costs were estimated at around 4 million Ottoman lira, a considerable portion of the state budget. Remarkably, the Hejaz Railway became the first Ottoman line built without foreign financing. Instead, roughly one-third of the funds came from voluntary donations by Muslims worldwide, following a call from Sultan Abdul Hamid II. Such was the railway's religious significance that it was designated as Waqf, an Islamic endowment. This meant the Ottomans did not own the line outright but managed it as a trust on behalf of God. The British tried to undermine fundraising efforts, fearing the threat the railway posed to their dominance in the Red Sea. Despite this, the money was collected and the main line from Damascus to Medina was completed in 1908. The route largely followed the traditional Hajj pilgrimage path, reducing a 40-day caravan journey to less than a week by train. 
While Mecca had been the original destination, a compromise was reached with Bedouin tribes to end the line short of the holy city, allowing them to continue escorting and protecting pilgrims along the final stretch. By 1914, a side branch from Damascus to Haifa via Dara was also finished, deliberately bypassing the French-owned railway between Damascus and Beirut. The rolling stock proved to be the single most expensive component for the cash-strapped Ottoman Empire, which was already struggling with debt sold to its European rivals. Sultan Abdul Hamid II initially planned to use only materials produced in Ottoman factories, but this proved unrealistic. Instead, the Railway Central Commission in Constantinople organized procurement from European suppliers, with Germany providing the bulk of the locomotives and wagons. Remarkably, some of these original vehicles can still be found today, abandoned along the tracks or at stations since the end of the First World War. By 1917, however, large parts of the line lay in ruins. Arab tribes and British forces, including the famous intelligence officer T. E. Lawrence, known as a Lawrence of Arabia, repeatedly attacked the railway during the Great Arab Revolt, when the Hashemites rose against Ottoman rule. Although the Hejaz Railway operated in its entirety for less than a decade, it left a lasting mark, particularly on Syrian national identity and pride. For a time, it had astonished the world as a triumph of engineering and ambition. The line continued to function in parts of Syria until 2011. Even as its condition deteriorated, it remained an important service, linking almost every major Syrian city and extending south into Jordan and north into Turkey. The once Grand Hejaz railway station in Damascus, with its ornate facade and marble-pillared entrance hall, was designed to impress departing passengers. Today, however, it stands as a shadow of its former glory. Neglected even before the outbreak of the civil war, parts of the station and its tracks were torn up for real estate development. For many Syrians, it has become a haunting symbol, a station without trains, and an empire long vanished. Over the past century, several attempts have been made to revive the Hejaz railway, and the latest effort appears to be underway now. In September 2025, Turkey, Syria and Jordan announced their willingness to restore this historic line. The agreement was reached during a tripartite meeting in Amman, Jordan's capital, as confirmed in a statement by Turkey's infrastructure minister Abdul Qadir Uralolu. The three countries have reached a preliminary agreement on a draft memorandum of understanding that outlines comprehensive cooperation in transportation infrastructure. As part of this initiative, Turkey has pledged to assist in completing the 30 kilometers of missing superstructure on the Syrian segment, while Jordan will assess its technical capacity to support the maintenance, repair and operation of locomotives within Syria. In addition, the three countries plan to carry out joint technical studies to improve Turkey's access to the Red Sea through Jordan's port of Aqaba. Road transport between Turkey and Jordan via Syria is also set to resume after a 13-year suspension caused by the civil war that ended in December, though that is another story in itself. This announcement reflects a broader shift in regional relations following the fall of Assad's regime. Turkey, which recently began training Syrian forces under a security agreement signed with Damascus in August, has positioned itself as the main foreign beneficiary of these developments and quickly dispatched its foreign minister to the Syrian capital. Jordan, too, has deepened its cooperation with Syria, signing several agreements with the country's current government. Together, these moves highlight how Turkey, Syria and Jordan are reshaping their cooperation, with the Hejaz project serving both as a powerful symbol of Ottoman-era continuity and as a practical step toward renewed regional integration. For now, little is known about the technical details of the project's future vision, but the current state of the infrastructure and the geopolitical context offer important clues. The tracks from Damascus via Dara to the Jordanian border are still largely intact, 
but it has been 14 years since a locomotive last traveled the route. The infrastructure is in a state of deep neglect, and in many places the rails and surrounding ground have been dug up by treasure hunters. This is fueled by a persistent legend that retreating Ottoman soldiers left gold hidden along the line. Since the fall of the Syrian regime, the lack of effective security forces has allowed this problem to worsen. On the Jordanian side, the railway cuts through lush landscapes and crosses long, arched, century-old bridges before entering the urban sprawl of the capital. Here a fragment of the line still lives on. From spring to autumn, the Jordan Hejaz Railway Corporation operates a passenger service from Amman to Giza station near the international airport. The trip takes around two hours and represents the last functioning section of the original Hejaz Railway still open to the public. Similar to Syria, in Jordan too, people feel a deep sense of connection with the Hejaz Railway. To understand this, it is worth recalling that in 1920, Abdullah, the son of Sharif Hussein bin Ali, Emir of Mecca and leader of the Great Arab Revolt, arrived in Jordan by train. A year later, he established the Emirate of Transjordan. Jordanians still regard the railway as one of the foundations of their country, since it delivered the man who founded their kingdom. At Ma'an Station in the south, where Abdullah first arrived, one of the station buildings became his palace. Today, the site serves as a museum, but it is also the southern gateway to the desert and the point where the line's condition begins to seriously deteriorate. Towards Saudi Arabia, after the tracks pass Batanal Ghul Station near Wadi Rum, the rails disappear altogether, stolen for scrap, dug out by excavators or torn up by treasure hunters. On the Saudi segment, fences have been erected around the old stations, but most remain unmonitored. Many barriers are cut open, the stations themselves looted and left in ruins, with floors and roofs collapsed. Public sentiment here also differs from that in Syria and Jordan. In Saudi Arabia, the Ottoman era is not something the current leadership chooses to celebrate, and the Hejaz Railway is often seen as a reminder of that legacy. Across the whole line from Damascus to Medina, conditions vary. Some stations have been turned into museums, many continue to decay, while others, such as Medain Saleh, near the UNESCO-listed Nabatean rock-cut site at Hegra, have even been transformed into luxury hotels. But what about the future of this historic line? On the Arabian Peninsula, ambitious rail projects are already underway. The proposed Gulf Railway aims to link Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Oman, Qatar, Bahrain and Kuwait by 2028. New metro systems and intercity railways are planned to connect regional capitals, while the high-speed train between Mecca and Medina has already achieved what the Hejaz Railway never could – a modern link between Islam's two holiest cities. Beyond the Gulf, rail and trade networks are reshaping geopolitics. The International North-South Transport Corridor seeks to connect India and Iran with Russia and Northern Europe across 4,500 miles of sea, road and rail. Iraq has launched its development road project, designed to link the port of al Fo with Turkey and Europe, potentially offering Asian goods a faster alternative to the Suez Canal route. Alongside China's Belt and Road Initiative and the US and EU-backed India-Middle East Europe Economic Corridor, the region is fast becoming a chessboard of competing corridors. In this landscape, the true geopolitical game-changer could be Syria. Once again, it has the chance to reclaim its historic role as a crossroads of trade and travel. Many argue that under Bashar al-Assad, Syria was effectively blocked from playing this role. Now that his rule has ended, the prospect of Syria integrating into these regional and intercontinental networks seems far more likely. Turkey backed sections of the Syrian opposition for years and is now in a prime position to benefit from the new leadership in Damascus. In late December, Turkey's transportation minister declared that he wanted steps taken to restore the railway connection from Istanbul to Damascus. 
Referring specifically to the Hejaz Railway, he stated, This project is not just about restoring a railway, it is about reconnecting a historical legacy. And it is precisely this historical legacy, combined with the changed situation in Syria and the renewed push for regional cooperation led by Turkey, that could provide the momentum to revive the Hejaz Railway in one form or another. Beyond symbolism, a restored Hejaz line could once again serve millions of Muslim pilgrims traveling to Medina and Mecca, complementing Saudi Arabia's modern high-speed services. Certain sections could be revived as cultural tourism routes, similar to restored heritage railways in Europe. More broadly, the line could reconnect Turkey, Syria, Jordan and Saudi Arabia, tying into larger regional initiatives like the Gulf Railway or China's Belt and Road, creating a north-south transport spine across the Levant. And while rail is still less competitive than maritime shipping, it could become attractive for inland cargo, especially agricultural products and containers, offering an alternative to trucking. Such a route would also gain importance during maritime disruptions, like those that have repeatedly affected the Red Sea and the Suez Canal. On the other hand, most of the line lies in ruins. Rebuilding would be enormously expensive, with little freight volume to ensure a return on investment. Political instability remains another obstacle, tensions in the region, Syria's fragile future, the devastating Israel-Palestine war, and Saudi Arabia's strained relations with its northern neighbors, all pose serious risks to the project's success. So what will happen in the end? Will the Hejaz Railway rise again, or is this just another dream lost to the desert winds? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit like and subscribe for more railway stories from around the world. To support our channel and get exclusive extras, check out our Patreon page. You'll also find the link to our ebook packed with detailed railway insights in the description below, plus some cool merch for all railway enthusiasts. See you in the next video, and until then, happy travels on the rails!